So in a world of algorithms, big data, and quantified selves, our next speaker believes that we're getting close to engineering out inherently important human qualities as we design. So he's here to share with us tonight, thank you for moving your way to the front, he's here to share with us tonight three rules of enchantment that'll help you build more romantic, human-centered, organic brands that help us all become more innovative in our work and more purpose-driven in our work. So I'll ask that you join me in giving a big round of applause to our final speaker on the stage tonight before we transition out of day three of Campus Party. Join me in welcoming Tim Leberek. All right. Wow, calling all romantics, you and you and you. Let's wrap up the day with some romance. Uh, exactly. Could it be more romantic than having thousands of people in the first row? Uh, <laughs> exactly. So this is a talk about uh, intimacy. I'm actually not sure if you need more romance after I checked out your, your camping uh, space. Uh, that was quite interesting. So anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be here um, and it's great to talk about uh, romance, and I'm actually quite curious about the theme of this event, which is feel the future. And I'm just curious, like, uh, raise your hand if you're optimistic about the future. If you feel like the future is going to be better than the present, raise your hand now. All right? Anybody else who thinks that the future is going to be better than the present? Okay. So if, if you feel like the future is going to be worse than the present, if you're pessimistic about the future, raise your hand now. Anybody? Wow, a lot of optimists. Okay, interesting. And now raise your hand if you uh, are or would consider yourself a romantic in your life. Okay, oh, quite a few hands. Any other romantics? You're romantic? Okay, and now raise your hand if you consider yourself a romantic in business. You are? Okay, okay, certainly fewer hands. Interesting. So, I'm a business person as well. I'm an entrepreneur. I actually worked with Jared for eight years. So you can imagine how much fun that was. Um, but I'm also an unabashed romantic. I believe what the world needs now, more than anything else, is romance. I think the world would be a better place if we had more romance in our lives. And I believe that we can find it and must find it and create it in and through uh, business. So just to clarify, if you're here and you want me to talk about office romance, it's not what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm also not talking about sort of this trivialized pop cultural version of romance, candlelight dinner and so forth. I am talking about romance um, as in experiences of awe and wonder, experiences in which we lose control, in which our hearts beat faster, uh, we have adrenaline rush and we fall in love with everything. And this kind of romance, I think, you can spend an arc all the way from Ada Lovelace, a romantic, by the way, the woman who invented, apparently, uh, computing, um, to Percy Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, then uh, more recently, David Bowie, certainly a romantic, James Blake, clearly a new romantic, Steve Jobs, right, probably the quintessential romant romantic entrepreneur, Elon Musk, maybe his true heir, if you will. And then Elastor City, right? A very romantic story of an unlikely success for a soccer team. But unfortunately, it's harder and harder to be a romantic these days because, you know, football is corrupted. There's a lot of disenchantment going on. And then if you work in uh, corporations, often the reality looks like that, right? So there's the manager of new growth ideas, position vacant. And we're facing this. Software is eating the world and robots are eating our lunch. And the economies um, that we're dealing with look like this now. Half of the world's wealth is in the hands of 1% of the population. That number actually really finally, long predicted, became a reality at the end of last year. We're working more than uh, people 30 years ago. And at the same time, we're suffering from heightened levels of stress. And we know that new jobs will require emotional, social, creative intelligence. 
Um, but only 30% of workers worldwide are actually engaged and fully committed to work. And then, of course, the robots are coming. You've probably heard about this a million times in the past few days. And AI and automation are expected to replace 50% of jobs in the next 10 years. And by the way, not only mechanical jobs, but also your jobs in the future, right? Knowledge workers uh, are really at risk. And there's going to be a lot of new occupations, and many occupations will cease to exist. So welcome to the second machine age. Welcome to the exponential organizations, organizations that are designed for efficiency, for winning at all costs, uh, and that are driven by algorithms. The poster boys being Amazon, and then, of course, Uber. And when we talk about these kinds of organizations, I think the phrases we often hear are, hmm, you know, they're, I don't agree with all their policies, but they're winning. They're really effective. Yes, they are aggressive, but they're winning. They're disruptive. Um, they're just the best solution. They're convenient, right? But algorithms are prone to uh, flaws as well. You've probably seen Microsoft's Tay chat bot that suddenly started to tweet obscene racist tweets. Uber introduced search pricing in the middle of the Sydney hostage crisis because an algorithm told it to do so, right? There was heightened, a heightened market demand and Uber introduced search pricing. Uh, and then Facebook inserted this picture of a four-year-old girl into the annual uh, highlights of a user not knowing that that girl had died that very year. And the user, Eric, uh, afterwards called it inadvertent algorithmic cruelty because algorithms have no compassion, no passion, no tact, no empathy. Right? They, they know how to do things right, but they don't know uh, what's the right thing to do. And as always, uh, a wise word from a Bond movie, a license to kill also means a license not to kill. And then very soon, maybe humans will be engineered out of our organizations and corporations uh, at all, right? The decentralized autonomous org organization, blockchain and so forth, might be the human-less corporation, uh, the human-less organization. So what does that mean for us humans, assuming that we still have a role to play, right, in the age of automation? Already we are expected to be consistent, flawless productivity machines, and increasingly we're now competing with smart machines, which turns us into smart machines ourselves. And we are applying the principles of optimizing, of maximizing now to the most intimate parts of ourselves, of our lives. So it's no surprise that we're seeing uh, a startup called the Self Hackathon. Uh, that we're monitoring and recording everything, all of our behaviors, our friendships, our activities, that we're rating everybody, our friends, our neighbors, our lovers, our parents, and that we're even uh, potentially using an app like this, Spreadsheets, which allows you to enhance your performance in bed based on data analytics. And if that doesn't work, there's a, a service called Breakup Text, that allows you to send automated breakup text messages. And if that's kind of strange to you, you want to stay away from the whole thing, you can use this service called Invisible Boyfriend. Uh, there's also, by the way, there's an Invisible um, Girlfriend, but it's in beta. But Invisible Boyfriend is out, and that service allows you to receive fake text messages, fake emails, and even fake phone calls at the opportune moment. So very soon, we might indeed be falling in love with our operating systems, as so beautifully depicted in the movie Her by Spike Jones. Maybe to me, that's sort of the, the iconic image of the past you know, two, three years. And the New York Times wrote about the movie, the great question is not whether machines will be able to think. The great question is, will humans still be able to feel? And indeed, when everything is measured, quantifiable, predictable, made convenient, then where do we find these profound experiences that punctuate our routines and give our lives meaning? Where are the strangers? Where's the strangeness? Where's the magic? We are at risk of engineering the romance out of our lives. Romance, which perhaps is the ultimate differential in a world of maximizers and optimizers. Now, the good news is we've been at a point of such disenchantment before. 200 years ago, the original romantic movement, Lord Byron, 
uh, John Keats, Novalis, all these romantic poets that you might have heard of at school, they actually uh, touted mystery and emotion and ambiguity in response to the disenchantment back then caused by the Age of Enlightenment, scientific rationality. And I would argue that we're now at the beginning and in need of a new romantic movement, this time in business, because business is so pervasive, and this time in response to the disenchantment caused by the datafication, the quantification, the algorithmization of everything. And I think the new poet, the romantic poets, the new romantic meaning makers can be you, our business people, entrepreneurs, software developers. Now, Looking at your faces, you're like, yeah, sure, I'm going to tell my investor I'm going to be a romantic, or I'm going to tell my boss I'm going to romanticize the organization. Sure. How is that going to fly, right? And how is that going to work? So I'm going to try to make it as concrete and practical uh, as I can, given the topic of romance. So first of all, it might help to identify the anti-romantics. Like who is not a business romantic? Who are the enemies of the business romantic? Well. Enemy number one is the cynic. And I actually had this in my presentation long before, you know, all the calamities of the past few months. But Donald Trump is really like the, the, the you know, the personified uh, cynic about whom Oscar Wilde wrote, he knows the prize of everything, but the value of nothing. Right? So he says, mm, it's business. It's nothing personal. It's business, right? But for the romantic, business is always personal, right? We have skin in the game. Enemy number two is the data cruncher. Now I live in Silicon Valley. I'm surrounded by data crunchers. Some of them are my friends. I have nothing against data crunchers. Data is a, is a good thing. But I think we have to be cautious that we do not confuse data as the only objective truth and do not accept any other parallel alternative truth. And in that sense, I think they are an enemy of the business romantic. And then the enemy number three is the transhumanist. So it's the scientist, the transhumanist, who wants to enhance, augment human performance, make it perfect. And by doing so, eradicating human error. And by doing so, eradicating poetry, ambiguity, romance, everything, I think, that makes our lives worth living for. Okay, but that's the negative vision of the business romantic, sort of distinguishing it from the enemy. So what is a positive vision of, of romanticism? What are the operating principles of business romance? So there's three that I'd like to share with you today. And the first one is called Find the Big in the Small. It's about intimacy. Did you know that the average American has only one close friend? And that number has gradually declined in the past few years. And by the way, it's not very um, different in, in European countries. So people speak of, a, of an age of loneliness, an age of anxiety, of social isolation, um, which is really astonishing uh, because we've probably been never more connected, right, given all of our devices. But here's the thing, the opposite of loneliness is not connectedness, is not togetherness, it's intimacy. And we are in desperate need for more intimacy in our um, digital times even though we're glued to our phones, right? And we're connected all the time. And I think we're seeing a number of ex experiences, workplace experiences and user experiences that are catering to that sense of intimacy. For example, the renaissance of the good old dinner, where strangers meet, break bread, and have an authentic conversation over dinner. There's a series in the U.S. that's becoming increasingly popular. It's a grassroots dinner series. It's called Let's Have Dinner and Talk About Death which is a very unlikely invitation for a dinner party, right? But it's a conversation about the dignity of a good death, a very intimate conversation about a difficult topic. I think intimacy is also driving um, the popularity of co-working and co-living spaces. It's basically collective intimacy with strangers, right? Common uh, in New York and the East Coast, or pot chair in Los Angeles, um, where I think in a very intimate way, you basically co-work and co-live together with strangers. Uh, and that's also, I think, why we're going to conferences. Um, you know, it's sort of this unexpected, we're meeting strangers, we're experiencing intimacy, certainly here. I mean, you're camping out in the camping pot there with 2,000 uh, other strangers, I think, for the most part, because we want intimacy. And then there's this social experiment conducted by a friend of mine in New York, Priya Parker. So she calls it the I am here days. And 
she gathers 15 friends one Sunday a month in New York City to explore a neighborhood of New York. And the rules are that you have to basically let go of all digital devices and you have to actually commit to spending eight hours together, which is incredibly hard uh, because there's a lot of boredom you know, involved. Um, but the assumption is that if you spend eight hours together, nonstop, uninterrupted, you're able to forge more meaningful, more intimate connections than when you spend eight times one hour together. Right? You're thickly present rather than thinly distributed. And I think this principle of thick presence is also something that we see in art, uh, especially in performance art. This is uh, from an exhibition by the performance artist Marina Abramovich at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. It was called The Artist is Present. And she sat across one visitor at a time, I think five minutes per visitor, for a total of 700 hours, looking at each other celebrating intimacy and vulnerability in a very extreme way, uh, admittedly. And then we're seeing the rise of slow entrepreneurship, slow food, and most recently, slow marketing. This is an ad by Ron Seal that literally shows paint dry for <laughs> several minutes, right? That is really uh, thick presence, if you will. I mean, not, all of the, uh, not everybody liked it, as you can see from Chloe's um, tweet here. Zappos, the online retailer, also is celebrating a thick presence by rewarding its customer representatives for the length of calls. So the longer the calls, um, the more rewards the customer representatives get. It's not about efficiency and lean transactions, but it's about thick presence. And then in the area of social networking, especially profe professional social networking, we're seeing this as well. Uh, this is a startup from Berlin. It's called Somewhere, and the CEO uh, basically is taking on LinkedIn and said, well, LinkedIn, you know, we're kind of endorsing people we don't know for skills they don't have. It's time for a different model. It's time for a platform that actually allows us to tell our work stories, a more intimate way of sharing our identities at work with others. Now, if you listen to all the, these experiences, you might think, oh, this sounds all very nostalgic, right? It's kind of going backward, like the good old days and, you know, touchy-feely. But they are nostalgic. But nostalgia is often misunderstood as a longing for a time gone by. But in fact, it comes from the Greek term nostos algos, which means pain from an old wound. And it describes an aching, a longing for something that is essential, profound, and that we have forgotten, that we have disconnected ourselves from. And I think more and more we're seeing experiences that are kindling, rekindling that sense of nostalgia. The return of the good old cassette tape. Nelly Furtado, the Canadian singer, released a new album last year only as a cassette. You know, really, uh, there you go, nostalgia back. Moleskine, the notebooks, of course, celebrating emptiness and this abundance of information. It's a very nostalgic product. This bookstore in, in uh, Tokyo, which only sells one book a month. <laughs> then the rise of the curatorial treating us as unique individuals, subjective human beings, and offering us an escape path from an algorithmic uh, world, right? And then there's this <laughs> application. That's my favorite. So this is not against anti-tech. I think what I'm trying to, to, to uh, share with you is that like you can use technology in a romantic way, in an intimate way. This is an app called Forgotify that allows you to discover and play the four million songs that have never been played on music streaming service Spotify. So it's using an algorithm to turn uh, against an algorithmic world, to, to provide a platform for the strange and for the quirky, for the romance that awaits us at the lonely end of the long tail. So see, all these experiences are celebrating intimacy. <laughs> the beauty of things that don't scale. Small moments of attachment which, as any relationship, marriage, researcher will tell you, are crucial for lasting, healthy relationships, the small moments of attachment.
Have you seen this before? So this is the um, this is the haka. It's um, a traditional dance that the New Zealand rugby team performs before games. They say they do it to honor the opponent. I'm not sure all the opponents agree. I think they're probably rather intimidated. It's a really odd thing, a really odd ritual. And the reason I'm showing you is uh, why I'm showing you this is. I find this so interesting. It's so irrational. It's just not, you just cannot explain it. Why, why is this happening suddenly out of the blue uh, uh, on, a, on a sort of sports pitch? And I think um, there's something about it that is just mysterious, that is inexplicable, but, but very, very powerful, which brings me to the second rule for the romantics, the second rule of enchantment, which is called keep the mystique. Now, it's kind of strange because we all tout radical transparency, we're inundated with data, right? The more we know, the better we can deliver our services with utmost precision. But I think precisely because of that, I believe secrecy and mystery make experiences meaningful again. So we're seeing the rise of ephemeral media, fleeting moments, Snapchat, of course, being sort of the, the pinnacle of it, pop-up studios, pop-up magazines, pop-ups everywhere, ephemeral media. Radio had the band a few weeks ago when it released its new album, trying to basically delete, erase its entire internet uh, footprint, right? In an attempt to foster, if you will, eternal ephemerality, right, on the web. It's almost like a, an impossible thing. Then there's this experiment in Boston. It's called Raining Poetry. So if it rains for a fleeting moment, you have poems on the sidewalk. It's a really beautiful uh, installation. Again, it's ephemeral media uh, celebrating the mysterious. Birch Box is a surprise box. Uh, where you receive a curated box with products in there. And the interesting thing about Birchbox is it doesn't really matter which product is in there. You know, the secret, the suspense is the product, the unboxing. The same principle applies to Secret Cinema. That's a startup in, in, uh, in the UK that shows so-called mystery screenings. So it gathers thousands of people at undisclosed locations to reenact uh, a blockbuster movie, but it's not telling anybody uh, which movie they're showing, right? But they're getting thousands of people to come. And here, too, I think what's really interesting is does not matter really what the movie is. The secret is the product. Mystery is um, the product. And then we have secret suppers becoming very popular um, everywhere, really. There's a startup in New York called Prime Produce that holds meetings, secret meetings in the dark. Uh, there's a business networking series called House of Genius where everybody can remain anonymous. So Johnny I from Apple might be in the room, but you don't know it because identities are not revealed. Then in Silicon Valley, so-called uh, secret rooms so is sort of the latest thing for all startup offices. Every startup office has a secret room. Uh, escape rooms is team building exercises are becoming very on vogue again. Secret societies, both in marketing but also at the workplace. Etsy, for example, has a so-called Ministry of Unusual Business, whose sole mandate it is to give a platform to the rebels, the contrarians at work, and to inject some otherness, some strangeness, strange events uh, at work. Then there's Traces, which is an app that lets you hide secret messages uh, in the real world for your friends to pick up. So it's kind of establishing a, a new category called mystery messaging, if you will. And if you think about it, all these traits, making the familiar strange again, commuting between different worlds and playing with multiple identities. They're quintessential romantic traits, but they're also the characteristics of augmented reality and virtual reality, right? They're sort of empathy-inducing, uh, they create intimacy, and you could argue that AR and VR are the new romantic technologies of a new romantic era. And it's probably no coincidence that Google, when it launched its new VR platform, called it Daydream, which I think both in its sort of posture and, and language harkens back to the Romantic era. So last year, the branding agency Lander put out a report and claimed that TMI, 
too much information is the new paradigm of doing business. I could not disagree more. Not enough information. NEI is much more effective. Knowledge might be power, but not knowing. Mystery is the far more powerful experience. And that brings me to the third and the last of the romantic principles and rules of enchantment, and it's called suffer a little. Now, as you probably know, if you've ever been in love and ever had a romantic uh, inkling, it's not always easy, it's not convenient. You have skin in the game, there's a dark side to it. It hurts, you suffer a little. But that is somewhat counter to the way we design most of our workplace and user experiences. They're all designed for instant gratification, ease of use, comfort and convenience, with Amazon being the pinnacle, which will soon deliver everything we could possibly desire via drone to our doorstep. And yet, at the same time, why is it that we camp out in front of Apple stores night and day before a new product is released? Why do we climb up to the mountaintops of the Alps at the Tour de France to see the leading bikers fly by in, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds? Why do we embark on this annual pilgrimage to the Burning Man uh, Festival of the Black Rock Nevada Desert to celebrate a week of radical self-expression, losing control? If you talk to evolutionary psychologists, they will tell you we do this because our brains are still wired for the Stone Age. We're still looking for life-threatening, existential events because they make us feel alive. They give our lives meaning. They punctuate our routines. However, we have all but banned them from our modern domesticated societies, right? Thank God. But we need them. We need them to derive meaning from them. So what do we do? Well, we go bungee jumping. We run ultra marathons. We go skydiving. Or we go to Ikea. IKEA has perfected the art of suffering. It has perfected the art of frustration, right? So if you've ever been to uh, the IKEA parkour, it's like the seventh circle of hell. And if you're like me and you try to self-assemble a Billy Oslo, a clip-on piece of furniture, it's like basically a, it's an exercise in sacrifice. It's a painful reminder of your own existential incompetence. And the same design principle, frustration, also applies to any kind of loyalty program, interesting enough, like frequent flyer miles, do you ever cash in ever in your life? I mean, they're all about permanent unfulfillment, delayed gratification. In that sense, actually very romantic, right? Permanent unfulfillment, the constant longing. And then there's this nightclub here in New York called The Box. So it was a conference in New York and the CEO of the club, Randy Weiner, spoke and he was asked, I said, so why is it, Randy, that, that your club has been so successful and hip for five, six years. It's really hard to be so hip in New York. And, and he said, well, it's very easy. We study very carefully what our customers desire, and then we do the exact opposite. Which means in the case of the box, that if you buy the highest price ticket, you end up in the kitchen doing dishes. And that is exactly the kind of suffering that sort of violates your mental models, that makes experiences that have been standardized and predictable meaningful again. And by the way, that is also the design principle for any viral marketing campaign. You make people suffer a little bit, quite literally with the ice bucket challenge. You break a mental model and expectation, you share it and you connect it to a greater purpose. And then you have, I think, <laughs> somewhat of a formula for a viral marketing campaign. So nothing is more terrifying for romantics than a life of ease and, and convenience and comfort. The more we sacrifice, the more we belong the more meaningful our experiences. So I would urge you to make your customers suffer. Frustrate them. Let them wait, right? Ask them to make an effort and reap the ultimate reward, which is the thrill not gone and the desire intact. So those are the three rules of enchantment, which hopefully helped illustrate this new romantic spirit that I'm observing uh, in the world of business and beyond. And I really do believe that we are on the cusp of a new romantic era and that we're shifting from a smart connected age to a new romantic age where a different set of qualities of virtues are becoming important. Ephemerality, uh, opacity, thickness, emotion over reason, danger over data, fluid identities over one 
clear single narrative, meaning over explanation, and the unquantified self over uh, this myopic belief in a quantified self. And so there is a shift uh, on this rather academic looking slide from the traditional world of business to the smart age to the new principles of the romantic age. And yes, of course it's true, we like comfort and convenience and we like some things to be predictable. But we love those brands and organizations who give us a heavy dose of punch drunk love, right? The fools and the rebels. And that's the core, I think, of human business in an age of AI and automation. Not only to do good, to feel good, but to feel more. And to build organizations that are built on those four pillars, on, on characteristics and qualities that machines cannot give us, which is character, ethos and moral integrity, acumen, which is essentially the ability to make quick judgments based on intuition, because intuition is always faster than knowledge, right? It's almost like preemptive knowledge. Spirit, imagination, meaning and hope, and of course heart, passion and compassion. And if you want to build beautiful organizations, I think <laughs> to, to use this uh, two by two, this beautiful two by two, the magical quadrant is really the one where you combine, of course, efficiency, a modicum of efficiency with love, the, maybe the most inefficient human quality of all, love. If you have neither of those, you have a very ugly uh, organization. And I do believe that romance has an ROI. So first of all, if you want to be innovative, you really need the romantics, the fools in your organization. You need people who can imagine that another world is possible. I mean, think of Airbnb. What a crazy idea that was, you know, five, six years ago, is to rent out your flats to strangers. Are you kidding me? And then secondly, if you want customers who really fall in love with you and are attached to you and not fickle, then you have to give them more than just solutions to problems. And the same is true for your employees. Perks and convenience is not enough. You have to add some drama, some mystique, some, some mystery to the mix. But I would argue the ultimate ROI of romance is more romance. Because romance is a human right. So I would encourage you to fight for it and to use data not just to demystify, to explain, but to mystify. And not just to design for, for, for convenience, but for friction to create things that are not only more useful, but more beautiful. Because I think we romantics, we don't want to solve all of our problems, we don't want to cure all of our pain, we don't want to answer all of our questions. We just want to feel more. And business is our ultimate adventure. So I want to leave you with a quote by the romantic poet William Wordsworth. It's kind of like a precursor of Nike's Just Do It. So how can you become, if you want to be a card-carrying romantic or you want to come out of the closet as a, a former cynic and become a romantic tomorrow in your organization, how can you do it? How can you build romantic muscle? Well, it's definitely about small habits and small changes, I would say. So first of all, of course, you can apply the three rules of enchantment that I shared with you. Uh, and you can just try to introduce them in very, very small ways in your organization and, and see what happens. And I promise you something beautiful, something unexpected is going to happen. You can buy my book, The Business Romantic, which has seven more rules, <laughs> and apply them as well. Uh, much appreciated. Or you can apply to the Business Romantic Society, which of course is a secret society that I founded um, that has gatherings worldwide. We host dinners. We have secret meetings. Um, this is a secret society you can become a part of. If you email me, uh, your application will be reviewed. Um, and then lastly, I think the, the most simple thing to do is to just use the term romantic and romance in a different way. So, so often in business we hear people say, ugh, you're romanticizing, you're romantic, right? Well, that's good, that's great. Romance is an integral part of business, of our societies, of our lives, so let's embrace it. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business person, but I'm also an unapologetic romantic, and I believe the world would be a better place, more so than ever now, if we had more romance in our lives. And I believe we can find it and we must create it in and through business. Thank you very much and thanks so much for hanging out. Do we have questions or do we throw the catch box? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we're going to do.
We're going to romantically throw the catch box, though, this time. Thank you very much, Tim. One more round of applause, please. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. It's really, yeah. really appreciated. And we're going to open the floor for a few questions before we close out tonight. Any takers? I do have one question for you. I know you shared some examples of how these rules can be applied. And within this context and this space with digital fabrication and automation, what's one example of how folks can begin applying these rules now? Well, I think you can, uh, you can, I mean, hacking is essentially something romantic, right? It's kind of like a deviation from the norm. It's very contrarian. So I think just by, by taking the everyday uh, routine, you know, at work and just kind of like hacking it. <laughs> uh, meetings in the dark is an example I shared. Uh, hacking processes, hacking the protocols of typical conventional business culture. I mean, it's really like small distortions, I think, that can build muscle. Even if you just like have a, uh, you know, if you uh, launch a secret society at your organization, you meet for 15 minutes every day, it does build sort of this habit of, of creating an, an alternative world in your organization. I think that is sort of the source code, if you will, for further romance along the way. But, you know, people sometimes say, well, what is a, can you point to a romantic organization? And I can, because this is a vision. I can, to, I can point to a lot of practices and a lot of brands and organizations that are already using some of these examples. But I can't say, like, there's this one firm that is, like, you know, uh, thoroughly romantic, right. right? That does not exist yet. I hope it will. So I know you hold this vision of what can happen if we do. Um, what happens if we don't? Well, I think we're seeing the beginnings of that already, right? I mean, we're seeing, um, I think, glimpses of a reality where humans are, I mean, uh, becoming a useless class and uh, where we apply all these, these principles we know from smarter machines to ourselves. And uh, privacy is really, I think, the right to be imperfect, and being human is the right to be imperfect. And I think romance, more than anything else, to me, embodies that. You know, sort of, there's always multiple meanings. There's not just one meaning. It's not a binary world, right? I think that's sort of the core message of romance. There's so many meanings and so many realities and so many. Uh, that's sort of the source of poetry. And I am worried that as we design these data-driven, um, efficiency-driven organizations without creating space for romance and for those aberrations, if you will, poetic aberrations, I think that we're going to live in a world that, that is going to look like the world of Amazon, which is not a world that I want to live in. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Share your name. Yes. Eva? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it's on. Yeah. Can you say something hopeful to me? Because I'm one of these romantic persons who probably is going to die in poverty with nothing, not, no clothes on my money because I'm not able to put the romance into uh, living or a money. Yeah. Well, I think here's the good news, right? So I think the, the optimistic view is that uh, if 50% of jobs will, will be replaced by machines in the next 10 years, it's going to create a lot of leisure time, which in a way is actually very sort of similar to what happened in the Romantic era. So we can become artists again. We can pursue our passions again in, in myriad ways, right? We're no longer sort of uh, slaves to the machine and, and just kind of uh, stuck in the corporation. So there is a new freedom, I think. There's sort of this allure of it. But one thing needs to happen. The wealth that is going to be created, like productivity and wealth need to be decoupled. Mm -hmm. And the wealth that's going to be distributed through automation, through smart machines, needs to be redistributed in much more in a, in a fair way, which essentially is, to me, uh, universal basic income. I just don't see any other way than universal basic income enabling me. But if that's the case, then I think we can actually be even more human than we've ever been, you know? And then I think it's an act of liberation. And I think there is a lot of momentum right now for universal basic income. Switzerland voted against, it's gonna vote again on it. Uh, even in America, usually a little bit behind in terms of social policies, it's coming up. And I, 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 that makes me actually very hopeful. And that is gonna actually be a cornerstone of a new romantic, a more human era. I hope that's, that's hopeful enough. It is yeah. for me. In the Netherlands, we are also experimenting that's right. with the universal that's right. basic mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, Eva, suffer a little. A little, not yeah. forever. <laughs> Suffer a lot. Not, I know, not weird, forever. Uh, I need to hack that. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? All right, any other romantics in the building? I know there were a show of hands. Where are you? It's okay. You can show yourself. Oh, somewhere. I saw quite yes. a few, yeah. <laughs> How are you applying it in your day-to-day -day life? We can pass the box to you. Yep, it's coming to you. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Uh, Matthias. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm not at all uh, applying it yet. I'm a growth hacker at TicketSwap, 
So I'm all about data-driven marketing. So romance, uh, in my view at the moment, if you apply romance and a little bit of... Is that a that sign? Was for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's it just turned off, but I can I can just repeat what you say. Yeah. Yeah, you're uh, saying uh, if you apply a little. We've got a handheld coming over oh, to you. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you apply a little bit of friction uh, into a website, I think you will lose uh, visitors who can become customers. So I don't know if I can apply it to my day-to-day -day job yet. Yeah. But I'm a romantic, so. <laughs> I think you know. The, so there's two concepts of time. One is Kronos, the Greeks. So sorry to sound so so ancient, but Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is sort of chronological time, efficiency, very linear. Kairos is sort of quality time, as we would now call it, which is inflated. It's nonlinear, and I think it's actually very interesting to look at user experiences and then identify moments where you definitely do not want to have any friction, right? Where people appreciate seamless service. Uh, where it's all logos, like logical, linear. But I think there are moments, uh, you know, maybe it's when, for example, like customer retention, when you lose a customer, when you kind of give more than you take and you surprise people. There are moments, I think, where you can play with friction, with a little bit of suffering. Um, Zappos, for example, if you apply for a job at Zappos, you have to actually first enroll in a social network you get vetted, and then you have to actually build sort of social capital first with current employees before you're eligible to apply. So they make you suffer a little bit. They build in friction to make it more meaningful that you actually get in front of the, the recruiter. So that's one example. So I think looking at the customer journey in terms of like, okay, here's a, here's a moment for friction. Here's a moment for suffering a little bit. Uh, here, certainly not. I, I think might, might be an interesting lens. I'm not saying like, you know, you have to have friction all along the way. That's going to put people off. But I think if we get the balance right uh, and we just create spaces, then I think actually it's a moment of differentiation. Awesome. Great point, great point. We've got time for one more. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're going to toss it to that All right the way in the back. back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh, he's seated in the back, but we're going to get the handheld to him. I was just yeah. eager to see the box fly. You can hold on to it. For yes. Now. Um, you were talking about applying uh, friction. Um, how do you create friction that is appealing and um, playful at the same time? Because that's what I see, um, what I think would be perfect for a website if you make it a little bit hard, but playful hard, like make it fun, make it a joke. How do you do that? Well, I mean, gamification is, is essentially, you know, I think friction, right? So you create a suboptimal, like, you, you know, it's constant challenges, you're rewarded. Uh, but it, it, gaming, if you will, is sort of suffering a little bit by design, right? So you, the, the, the gratification is delayed by, by design. And I think that's, I mean, that's one way, I think, to, to create uh, friction and, and, and introduce sort of this, this moment of play. Um, I also find it quite interesting in... You know, for example, slow marketing, right? Sort of these ads that are now apparently popping up where um, advertisers celebrate this like seemingly boredom unfolding of drying, you know, paint going dry and others. I mean, that's really very contrarian, but it is meaningful and it stands out because it's just not what we expect, right? And we, we sort of suffer with it. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting. And the same is true about long form content, um, you know, and political campaigns. And people will tell you that. Uh, for example, for the first Obama campaign, the, the videos that were 40 minutes long had more eyeballs than the three-minute clips. You know? So there is something about sort of being this intimacy that's created by long form and you know, sort of the, the inefficiency of it that creates more attachment than, I think, just sort of the lean transaction. Right? But again, I think it's a matter of like, what is the experience, what do you want it to be? And I think that the broader your range of expressions and sort of, 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 of playful interactions, and also like surprising, really surprising, like catching your, your audience off guard. Um, I think that that's helpful. Strangely enough, most brands only do that on April's Fool's Day, right? <laughs> then they have the permission to basically be something completely different and try out another persona. Um, and not very many brands actually have sort of give themselves permission to, to catch you off guard and really surprise you. And I think uh, the more we automate and standardize, the more space there will be for, uh, you know, for these kinds of playful maneuvers.
great question. Thank you. And th there's 10 rules in total, right? There are 10 rules there are in 10 total. Rules in yeah. 10, and we get the rest by picking up the book. That's right. The business romance. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank so one you. One more round of applause, please. Thanks. And